welcome to risk roundup progress and development necessitates exploring the unknown and exploring the unknowns requires us to push the boundaries of science and technology irrespective of whether it is exploring the cyberspace geospace or space science and technology driven exploration helps us solve fundamental problems facing humanity for not only today but also the coming tomorrow as we begin space exploration satellites seem to be playing a very important role in space endeavors from the very first satellite that captured the attention of the world and launched the beginning of the space age exploration to the thousands of satellites that we see today in space satellites have gone through fundamental transformation and brought revolution and evolution thousands of satellites of all sizes and shapes are operational in space today while many of these satellites are often positioned outward for scientific exploration purposes and a better view of the whole universe there are so many satellites that are pointing towards us to give us a better view of earth itself and there are also many satellites that are pointing sideways to monitor other satellites and so on it is not just the position and direction of the satellites that is evolving the size and nature of satellites are evolving too satellites are becoming smaller these miniaturizing tiny satellites nano satellites are revolutionizing the space endeavors and industry as they can do everything traditional satellites are able to and that too in a much more affordable and effective manner what is promising is that the accuracy affordability accessibility and adaptability offered by these tiny satellites is giving nations a whole new way to chart and explore not only the enormity of space but also help us manage the complexity of our planet earth in cyberspace geospace and space to discuss nano satellites further i am honored to welcome may moalam to risk round up may is the founder and ceo of sky and space global with european and israeli centers of aerospace satellite and software in his previous roles may has served as the head of space system branch in the israeli air force and led the medex experiment on space shuttle columbia as the project manager for israel's first astronaut flight and has also led Israel's satellite projects including Ofek and Texar. Mayor was awarded the Israel's National Security Award in 2009. Welcome Mayor. We are so honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank yes. you for inviting me. Wonderful Mayor. So let us begin the discussion by addressing the shift in approach. Over the years nations have launched heavier satellites. What shifted the approach towards miniaturization of satellites? Well, I think it was a combination of uh, several things. Uh, one, of course, you know, technology moves forward uh, with the miniaturization of almost every aspect uh, of uh, electronics, for example. So that's one part uh, of it. The other thing is the lowering down of the cost of launch right, to space. So uh, if you combine these two together, uh, through the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years, we've seen a significant reduction in the size, the mass of the satellites, but also in the cost required to develop them, develop the satellites themselves and launch them to space. Because, you know, when we're launching stuff to space, we're paying by the pound or by, by the kilogram. So uh, if you have a smaller satellite with a less mass, it will cost you less to, to launch it to space. But something else has happened as well. Traditionally, when we uh, developed satellites, we had to go through a very rigorous and long process of qualification, uh, space qualification for the hardware itself, where we had, you know, to test everything uh, to the radiation uh, uh, parameters, etc., etc., and that would make the cost of satellites increase more and more. Whereas today, as we're looking at what we call the new space technology, we have a different approach since the satellite is very low cost to produce and low cost to launch. So we're saying, Okay, we don't have to test it really that rigorously. Let's put something in space and see how it, how it works. So it's almost like, you know, sending your uh, uh, smartphone to space. Uh, and if it doesn't work, well, we'll send another one. So not exactly that. I'm taking it to the extreme, but just to demonstrate the way that the uh, industry has evolved in the last few years. Yes, no, that's an excellent point. And uh, those are very good reasons for us to be able to shift the approach. So historically access to space used to be exclusive expensive and restricted to governments and selected corporations now we are witnessing what can be called as a democratization of space as nanosatellites 
seem to be transforming space access and make it affordable, accessible to everyone. Since any individual or entity across nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia is now in a position to build its own nanosatellites and launch them, what impact do you see because of this democratization of space? Well, you, you're quite right in what you're saying, and this this is uh, this presents a real challenge because as long as nations were the only ones who could uh, launch satellites to space, so they were obviously obligated to the uh, to the international agreements and the UN resolutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you have, as you said, a single entity, a student in a university who can raise uh, 100, 200 thousand dollars, and he can launch his satellites, what guarantees us? that he still will adhere to all of the conventions and the regulations as far as let's say the uh, 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 frequency spectrum or the orbits of the satellites how do we make sure uh, satellites do not uh, you know collide with one another do not interfere with one another and this is a tremendous uh, challenge uh, and i'm not sure that the international uh, community uh, is uh, fully adapted to this new uh, uh, challenge. There are still uh, gatekeepers, so to speak. So, for example, uh, uh, our satellites, Sky and Space Global's three satellites, which we call the Three Diamonds, were launched in India on board the Indian launcher, the PSLV, which belongs to the Indian Space Agency. So, the Indian Space Agency uh, did for us some kind of a due diligence in order to make sure that we meet international regulations and that we have the license from uh, uh, the spectrum uh, point of view etc uh, etc et but who guarantees us for example that the private companies like uh, uh, rocket lab or like virgin or like others will still uh, take upon them themselves to force the international regulations and the international agreements so i'm sure that the ones i've mentioned like virgin and rocket lab I'm sure they are doing that, but you know there are more and more players coming into the field of launching satellites to space, and as you have said, increasing number of people are producing satellites and trying to launch them to space. So this is a very big challenge that the international community has to think, how do we address that and how do we make sure that we keep space a safe haven that uh, can still be used for the benefit of all mankind. No, that's an excellent uh, point that you made there and that does bring very complex challenges because who if we don't have any governing body or any gatekeeper that does for each and every nation we are not sure any nation any individual any entity can from any respective nation can create their own uh, launch vehicle and uh, launch some uh, nano satellites in space we don't know what those nano satellites are supposed to be used for or we don't know what kind of you know risk it brings what kind of complex challenges because it's not just the small nano satellites we are talking but we have traditional large satellites that that are doing some very critical work for each and every nation for the humanity in space so what kind of risks are emerging from that those are very complex challenges and I'm, I hope that you know all the nations and all the space organizations they get together and create some sort of guidelines some sort of governing body that manages those kind of complex challenges and be the gatekeeper like you just talked about how the Indian Space Agency they made sure that all the you know regulations and requirements that you are supposed to meet that you have done that but I we should you know work towards creating sort of some sort of a common framework, some sort of uh, cooperation, collaboration between all, each and every space agency and each and every space entity, because now it's private public uh, partnership. It is no longer just the governments. So it makes it much more difficult, much more complex because and there are very, very complex players involved now. So let's hope that in the coming years, we are able to uh, create that sort of organization that sort of collaboration and cooperative environment so that we can meet the complex challenges now with the democratization of space sending satellites into space is going to continue to get cheaper as you just mentioned uh, in the beginning now there are indicators that show the space exploration moving towards distributed ownership of space assets and assets along with the data and communication services they produce so how does this new emerging economic model of sharing economy in space revolutionize the global systems in cyberspace geospace and space 
it, it is it is a very big challenge but do, don't get me wrong it's not that we have to be you know really concerned about this these coming dangers from democratization of space because uh, it is still very difficult to build a working satellite and it's still very very difficult to build a successful uh, launch vehicle uh, so uh, as you as you know many are trying not many are succeeding in that so th there's a kind of a, a, almost a, a technological barrier that helps us in, in uh, confronting this uh, 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 this problem so it's not uh, something that we should dread or sh we should really fear from it's something that we should put into our mind and uh, the international space community should act you know like uh, uh, good global citizens and work together in in trying to to keep as I've said, to keep space uh, uh, something which is safe uh, 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 for us. I think we're, we're witnessing, you know, uh, we're in the era of globalization. Things are changing throughout the world almost in every aspect and in every segment that you... Uh, space is no different uh, with that regards. Uh, we will see probably more and more uh, private uh, entrepreneurship uh, looking into space as a commercial arena where we can get uh, revenues from, exactly like what we're doing. Uh, and But we will also see the governments keep on working and keep on uh, uh, using space, probably for the larger projects, you know, like going to the moon or going to Mars, or of course, uh, Department of Defense projects, you know, uh, like uh, spy satellites and communication, military satellites and, and so forth. But the private market will probably take more and more the usage of space. We have been hearing talks about constellations of hundreds of satellites. Uh, we are building a constellation of 200 satellites as a first stage, but we know uh, of companies like uh, OneWeb or others, which again are planning to deploy hundreds and hundreds of satellites. And if we not, if we do not work together, everybody will lose. So it's a common interest for the company and the industry to to join hands and uh, make sure that uh, each of us. Uh, makes the most out of it without interfering with the others. Yes, absolutely. Now, how many nanosatellites are in the space currently and how many more do you expect in the coming years? <laughs> Very difficult uh, to say. If you look at the number of satellites launched per year, you would see that in 2015 there's been a significant rise of satellites and that's, that is mainly due to nanosatellites, uh, about 100. In 2016, we've seen uh, a larger number and as time moves forward, we expected numbers to reach, I don't know, hundreds or thousands within a few years. Again, because it costs a, a fraction of the cost of a large satellite. Yes. And with the, the development of technology, you can do with very small satellites almost the same uh, uh, things, almost the same mission, almost the same results, more and more. And again, what I've said about constellations, it's not only launching a satellite. So maybe you'll have, I don't know, uh, 200 universities across the globe, each one launching one or two satellites. That's not the big thing. The big thing is constellations of hundreds and hundreds of satellites, um, um, you know, revolving around the Earth, and we have to maintain their orbits and make sure they do not collide with each other, they do not interfere with one another. At the end of the day, I think it will make the Earth a better place. Yes, better absolutely. Service, better services of communication, better services of of uh, uh, information, of data, of uh, weather, etc., uh, etc. Et so all in all, it's a good thing. We have to make sure that it stays on the right track. Absolutely, it is a great thing, I would say. You know, and if we look at these uh, different satellites, there are so many different uh, variations. I see out of large, medium, mini, micro, nano, PECO and FIMTO satellites, what makes nano satellites most appealing for space initiatives? Uh, well, I think it's a combination of, um, as I've said, the um, affordable cost of building such a satellite, together joined with the uh, technology that you can put on it. You've mentioned PICO satellites, which are less than one kilogram. There's not much you can do with PICO satellites today. You can put a very small uh, communication payload on that, which can work at very, very low data rate, doesn't have real uh, uh, value. Um, 
You can build a satellite which is 100 kilograms and put a very powerful camera on it, but it will cost you tens of millions of dollars. So this, it's a kind of a sweet spot when you're talking about the give or take 10 kilograms per satellite, uh, that on the one hand, it's very, very small, low cost to produce and launch to space, and on the other hand, very capable with regards to the technology that you can put on it. Yes. What makes it very appealing. And also, you know, the history of nanosatellites is that it started as a, as a academic uh, exercise, almost. And even today, most of the uh, nanosatellites being launched, other than the commercial ones, are made by universities. That you can take a group of students, build a small uh, space lab in your university, and the students can exercise actually building the satellite itself, testing the hardware and the software, and at the end of the day, put it on a rocket and launch it to space and monitor it as it, it's working. So it's, it's very, very appealing. On the one side, low cost, low mass, low cost to launch, and on the other hand, very capable technology. Yes. And uh, again, if I'm talking about ourselves, that's exactly what we're doing. We're taking nanosatellites, which are very small, we're using uh, uh, a very advanced communication technology, and we're building with that an infrastructure of satellites and the network in space to provide the services that we plan to, to uh, uh, provide. So talking about your organization and your initiative, what are you trying to achieve? What, how many nanosatellites have you launched already? And what are the products and services you are uh, trying to provide to the global community? Uh, we have launched three satellites so far. All of them were launched uh, two months ago on June 23rd, as I've said, from uh, uh, India, Satish Dhawan uh, Spaceport. And um, what we plan to build is something much more challenging than that. If that communication is a basic human right, and everybody are entitled to exercise this basic human right and to be able to communicate with each other and to connect to the rest of the world. Now, if you look at the uh, global map, you will see that uh, there are a lot of areas, uh, a lot of people, something like 3 billion people, are quite disconnected from the grid. So services that we find almost you know, uh, a part of our lives, like being able to pick up the phone and call someone or, or send a text message or a WhatsApp message or to surf the internet, is something that they cannot even uh, imagine because they have no network and no infrastructure. Is to deploy nanosatellites over the equatorial region where you have most of these three billion people living in and provide them with these connectivity services being able to make a phone call send a text message get an email uh, uh, send data from one place to another connect the increasing number of machine to machine and internet of things devices uh, um, to, to the network and to the uh, end users that require the data from them. And what separates us from other companies is that we will do it in affordable rates. Since we are using nanosatellites, the capex, the capital required to build our endeavor is very, very low. It's less than $200 million. Uh, so that enables us to provide the services that I've just talked about at affordable service, at affordable prices to the people living in these regions. So whether you live in Central Africa, or in Indonesia, you would be able to use Sky and Space Global Network and uh, send a, a WhatsApp message to your uh, either loved one or business associates, uh, etc., etc., which is something you cannot do today because there's nothing at the area you live in. Yes, very true. And that is so very much needed. So I'm glad that you are uh, creating those kind of services for each and every, you know, citizen across, you know, very, irrespective of where they are living, whether they are in cities, whether they are in, you know, some rural areas. So that is so very much needed. Now, building nano satellite is one thing and launching in space is whole another. So apart from International Space Station, what are the other launch platforms for nano satellites? Well, the launch vehicle, you talked about that you use the ISRO's, you know, launch vehicle. But what are the launch platform for nano satellites? Uh, it's, it's a very good uh, question. Uh, you can um, almost uh, divide the launch uh, vehicles to uh, uh, two types. One is the government, 
the governments which are launching to space, like uh, ISRO or like the European Space Agency or the French Space Agency, etc., and the private endeavors like uh, SpaceX, like Virgin Orbit, like Rocket Lab, and others. So up until now, these launches were adapted to these very, you know, very uh, large, very high mass. Uh, satellites and that means that the cost is very very expensive tens of millions of dollars per launch whereas when you're launching nano satellites you don't need to launch two or three tons of mass to space you need to launch 100 kilograms 300 kilograms 500 kilograms not more than that uh, personally we have selected uh, virgin virgin orbit uh, which is part of the virgin group uh, they are developing a dedicated launcher to small satellites so they have identified this market of uh, small satellites, uh, nano satellites, and low mass satellites, as a market that requires a solution, what they call a launcher one, which is a big rocket that is installed on a 747, and then you can launch it anywhere in the world. We've contracted Virgin for uh, four dedicated launches from the equatorial region, and they, uh, in each launch, will provide us the capability of launching multiple nanosatellites, uh, dozens of them, uh, into the orbits that we require. Now, as I've said, we see more and more initiatives of that kind, Virgin and Rocket Lab, only two of them, but there are others as well, uh, both in the United States, but in other areas of the world also, uh, because again, you know, uh, it's, it's the rules of the market where there's a demand, somebody is building the supply. Yes. Uh, so I guess yes. we'll see more and more launch providers in, in the coming years. This will not eliminate, eliminate those, you know, very big uh, uh, launches that can launch these uh, multi-ton uh, satellites. They will still exist. So we'll see this kind of uh, diversion of, of the launching uh, community, so to speak. Yes, very true, very true. Now, it seems nanosatellites have a relatively short life, probably a couple of years. And these, uh, what can be done? To increase the short life, because uh, each of the nanosatellites, as they try to re-enter the atmosphere, it just burns up, and they don't last more than a year or two in the low Earth orbit that we are talking about. So, what could be done to increase the short life? Yeah, well, well, where other people see a problem, I see an opportunity, and we, as a company, see an opportunity, and I'll explain why. Uh, if you recall, I've talked about the high prices for the traditional space industry because we had to test everything and make sure it works. And that was because we were launching satellites to be in space for 10 years, 15 years, to work for 15 years, it costs a lot of money to develop that. Um, but if you think about the fact that technology is moving forward very, very quickly, so actually uh, a short lifetime becomes almost an advantage because it forces you to replace the satellite. And if you replace the satellite, you can replace it with a better technology. Now, with regards to the satellites burning in the atmosphere, that only depends on the altitude of the orbit. So take us for example, our first satellites have been launched to 500 kilometers. They can remain for more than five years. Uh, our operational satellites in the constellation will be launched to 700 kilometers, where they can stay for decades. Um, not work that long. The electronics will probably die around five or seven years, maybe a bit more than that. Now, as I've said, we look at that and say, well, that's not a problem. So uh, every year we will replace 25%. That means that each satellite will live or will operate no longer than four years we will probably find ourselves deorbiting and decommissioning fully operational satellites just because we want to replace them with better one. And if you think about it, it's exactly like we replace our smartphone every two or three years. You know, you have the uh, Galaxy S8 coming out. Oh, I have to replace my uh, S6. It's been around for two years, too long. Uh, so it's exactly the same. Technology moves forward. We, you will have better solar panel, better communication payloads, better software. Um, everything will improve, so you can always maintain yourself at the front edge of technology, always upgrading your system, increasing your capacity, and increasing your capability of providing better service to your customers. It's a built-in uh, uh, upgrade uh, capability.
Yes, no, you're absolutely right. And that's an excellent point that it forces you to innovate. It forces yes. you to adapt to new technology and new innovations. And as we see, the technology advances are happening so rapidly. So it's good that, you know, every couple of years you have to replace those nano satellites. So that forces you to come, you know, have a more secure or more stable software, more uh, stable hardware and more technological advances. You can uh, uh, incorporate a lot, many, you know, things uh, that you may not have thought about it, you know, when you launched it first. So that's an excellent analysis. Now, from solar storms disrupting the satellite communication, to cyber attacks disabling global positioning system and space debris knocking out so many you know earth monitoring yes. satellites there are so many complex threats to the space infrastructure they are all very real now while space assets provide the technological backbone for the critical infrastructures that we are building and we have built across cyberspace geospace and space does it have the security infrastructure that it needs do we have the security infrastructure that we would like to have it's, it's a good question. You know, I think up until uh, uh, a few years back, maybe uh, a year or two ago, if you talked about cybersecurity issues in space, people would probably raise an eyebrow and say, okay, well, what exactly are you talking about? That's not an issue at all. And that was based on, on the fact that one, satellite protocols were very, very, you know, hush, hush, everything was done by the governments, by the military. And uh, uh, you, you needed to invest a lot of effort in order to be able to penetrate those protocols or to transmit to the satellites, etc. But I think what happened in the last years is that people understand cybersecurity is a big thing. It's a big thing for, our, you know, uh, internet bank, bank account, but it's going to be a big uh, thing for satellites as well, exactly like other networks on, on the ground. And uh, I believe that uh, whoever wants to enter the space segment and to deploy space assets has to think about it and has to build within his system uh, uh, this kind of capabilities of these kind or, of early warning systems or recovery systems. Because although today uh, we haven't seen yet, as far as we can tell, a cyber attack on a satellite, uh, you you can probably assume that it will happen sometime in the future, maybe not from governments, which are usually more responsible, but some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a hacking organization or uh, a commercial competition or, or something of that sort. So it's something that uh, space players need, need to think about. Yes, very true. And do uh, we have, you're absolutely right about that. So do we have encryption in the... Uh, are those encrypted, you know? And uh, if we identify that there are some security flaws in the software component that we are using for the nano satellites. Is it possible to update those security flaws once uh, it is already up in the space? Yeah, of course, I cannot talk about uh, others. And unfortunately, I cannot really detail about what we are doing uh, other than saying that we're looking uh, into that and we're taking that into consideration and we fully understand the severity uh, of cybersecurity threats and the need to be protected. Uh, now, with regards to your question, usually that is the case. So usually uh, you can update the software on board the satellite. Uh, you have a telemetry channel to the satellite and usually it's, it's the common practice uh, to be able to upgrade software features on that satellite. Uh, however, it's probably a lot better if you take that into consideration at the initial stages of designing the system because it's not only the software, you know, sometimes there are a hardware implication as well, for sure, firmware implications. And if you think about it from day one, it helps you design uh, a better and more sustainable system. Now, I want to touch about something you've mentioned, which is space weather, as we call it, or solar storms, solar flares. This is a very big thing. Um, a major solar event uh, can have huge implications on satellites. Now, fortunately for us, uh these events are quite rare but they happen from time to time uh, our sun is you know a, a big thermonuclear plant and uh, is very very active and these things happen from time to time global systems which monitor the sun and give you some kind of an early warning of a solar flare or a solar storm and the particles moving towards the earth and you can take some measures 
in order to be uh, protected uh, by those. But this is a big issue, and there have been incidents in the past where a, a solar event caused malfunctions in, in several uh, satellites. And, you know, we as, as a society are becoming more and more dependent on technology, satellites especially. So if, God forbid, we had a cataclysmic uh, solar event, uh, it will be uh, a devastating event um, for technologies worldwide and for space assets as well. Absolutely. That is a big cause of concern. And uh, as you talked about the cyber attacks, that while we have not seen one, uh, at least, you know, what is publicly known, uh, there, this is a cause of great concern because any individual hacker or any group of uh, people who wants to create havoc in space system and thereby impact the systems that we have developed in cyberspace and geospace, everything is connected now. The computer code and con connected computers and internet is connected cyberspace to geospace and space. So if somebody is able to use that and create a problem in our satellite systems that we have created, the, the existing and systems that we have in the space or in the geospace or cyberspace, that, that is, they can create a lot of destruction. So uh, you, we talked about uh, briefly about the hardware and software issues, you know, in the satellites that could happen, that could be breached, but how secure is the information that the satellite transmits and how secure are the network of ground stations that satellites rely upon? I think it all depends on the company uh, who's, who's delivering this uh, service and how much was it aware for the potential uh, damage and the potential threat by uh, cybersecurity. Or uh, even uh, forget about cybersecurity. If you're transferring sensitive data of your customers from one place to another, you have to protect it. Uh, uh, you have to uh, encrypt it. You have to provide your customer with the insurance uh, that his data is, is safe. And uh, otherwise, you will not have a commercial business. So again, we see the market forces playing here. If you're providing a service that is not protected, nobody will use it. Um, if you're asking how much is it common practice today for space assets to utilize cybersecurity measures, then I think we, are, we still have a, a way to go. Again, not talking about Sky and Space Global, as I've said, we are uh, uh, fully aware of the challenge and the required measures. But if you look at what happens uh, uh, globally, we still have a way to go. Uh, by the way, this is an unfortunate thing. I mean, j just think, it, it's almost like uh, if you think about the se security measures that we have to go to, through when we're boarding a plane, it's, it's something that nobody really wants. All of us would be much happier uh, if uh, nobody would have tested us and uh, checked our luggage when we go to a plane because why do that? But there are people who are trying to damage airplanes and there are people who are trying to damage data. We see it, as you've said, on a day-to-day -day basis. We see cybersecurity attacks on, on banks, on hospitals, on uh, databases uh, globally. And the, again, it's at the hands of the international community of governments to come to general global agreement that we have to fight this phenomena and we have to eradicate it because at the end of the day, uh, it's not that it will damage only one nation or only one type of people. It will damage every, everyone. If the financial global infrastructure is damaged, it will be, again, a devastating event. And it doesn't really matter if the uh, hacking group came from uh, uh, Russia, China, US, Africa, or Brazil. It doesn't really matter. Everybody will suffer. Joint uh, effort. Until that happens, it's up to the players, it's up to the space companies to be uh, responsible and to take measure to protect themselves and their customers, of course. Very true, very true. No, that's a very good point. Now, uh, anything is possible, like we you just you know mentioned, and the resilience of this cyber system needs to be built upon effective encryption, very robust system architecture that uh, we can continually up update the software and we can have effective monitoring and response. So what kind of encryption space satellites are using? Is it quantum encryption? Because uh, I just heard that, you know, I think China has launched a quantum encryption based uh, space satellite. Is that a common practice now? Or are we going towards that? Or are we even using encryption? 
Uh, well, uh, as I've said, unfortunately, there are still a lot of space assets which are not using any encryption at all. Um, because, again, nobody thought that it's an actual threat. Suppose that you uh, have a weather satellite and you download the data once a day over a ground station or twice, twice a day over a ground station. Nobody really thought that anybody will even try to hack into such weather satellite. Uh, so it, it was not the common practice. I believe today that it's becoming more and more apparent that you have to do that. Uh, quantum encryption, I think, is still uh, down the road. We're not there yet. But, you know, even if you're using, uh, let's say, internet standard encryption protocols, this is very safe. We have very good encryption protocols which are commercial, which are fully available to, to anyone, and they're very tough to beat. They're very tough to crack. Uh, so even if you do a small step these kind of protocols into your system, that's that's a, a good uh, starting point for a system and your satellites. Yes, very true. Now, we, we talked about the solar flares and we talked about cybersecurity risk, but Earth is also already surrounded by so much space junk. So isn't the democratization of satellite adding to the complex challenges of space junk? Aren't we not adding more and more? Yes, yes, it's, it's a challenge. Um, I'll first describe the problem and then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll insure you for a little bit. Uh, so yes, there are more and more satellites and there are tons of space junk. Uh, remains of, you know, the early ages of the space race where nobody really cared or nobody even thought about the, the problem of space junk or space debris, as we call it. Um, fortunately for us, we are monitoring uh, most of the objects in space over a size of a few centimeters, and we know their orbits, uh, and we can predict whether we will have a close encounter, so to speak, between a satellite and a space debris, or even between satellites themselves. This is not a foolproof system, but it provides some kind of, of, uh, uh, of assurance for the operators themselves. Um, there has been some progress. So there is an international convention that says you have to prove that you can deorbit it within 25 years. So you have to take that into consideration when you develop the satellite uh, with regards to the amount of fuel on the satellite, etc., that you can prove you can decommission it and deorbit it within a period of 25 years. Again, so uh, at least our generation will not leave any additional uh, space junk for future ge generations. Uh, there has been progress in the systems which are monitoring space and monitoring satellites and providing early warning um, from close encounters. But we also have to remember that uh, there is a lot of space in space. So if we're talking about, uh, let's say, 10 or 20,000 objects currently in space, it's very big out there. And the probability of collision is not that high. It exists, it's not zero, but it's not that high. Um, for us, for example, you know, we plan to launch 200 satellites, that's quite a lot of them, but each satellite will be separated uh, around 1,000 kilometers from its uh, nearest neighbor. So that's quite uh, far. And we will monitor them uh, in almost on real time with the help of the, uh, um, United States Department of Defense, which operates uh, the, the tracking organization for that. So we would be able to get early warnings, satellites which are flying close by or space debris which will be close by, and we would be able to take uh, uh, evasive action, so to speak, uh, in order to make sure that we will not uh, uh, be at risk of collision. And of course, our satellites will deorbit once they conclude their mission and will burn in the atmosphere since they are, you know, about this big. So that's not a problem. That's good to know. So now the world is expected to face extraordinary changes in the coming years as nations compete to have their stake and supremacy in space. I mean, at this point, pretty much every nation are trying to, you know, get into the space initiatives and to, trying to get into the space war, uh, you know, 
endeavors for the benefit of their nation, obviously. Now, in space, growth means more satellites, more space travel, more digital devices, more connectivity, more data opportunities, as well as the risk. We talked about some risk, you know, also. We haven't covered all the different variables of risk, but we have addressed a few common ones. Now, how do you see the current and emerging technological change influencing the global power dynamics in space? Well, I see it as a good thing. I, I mean, I think that uh, the fact, as you said, that access to space is easier, that the technology is now uh, globally spread, and we see more and more nations becoming part of the uh, space uh, community uh, or the space family, I view that as a very good thing. Space is one of the most powerful engines uh, to, to develop the economy, because if you invest in space, you develop um, multi layers of your economy in a very good way. Uh, you pull forward the education, the technology, the uh, financing uh, community. Everything is being pulled uh, to a higher level uh, if you invest in, in space. So, if we do that, we actually improve the lives and improve the quality of living uh, in, in, in almost every aspect. So, all in all, I think this is a, a, a good process and a good thing. Again, as long as we as an international community make sure that we adhere to the uh, 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 conventions and the regulations and um, we work together and not one against the other. Absolutely. Collaboration and cooperation. Now, while space is currently an area where almost no rules of engagement apply, at least at this point, each nation will face difficulties in creating a very stable environment for, from conflicting national opinions regarding freedom of space exploration and application of international law. Do you see problems emerging because of the origin of space satellites in the coming years? Um, not really. You know, the history is very interesting about that. Uh, uh, the fact that space is defined as something which belongs to the entire human race is not that uh, understandable. If you look at history, uh, empires and civilizations usually used, you know, to, to plant the flag or, or claim the territory for themselves. And what we, we saw at the early ages of the space race between the United States and then the Soviet Union was something quite different, where they mutually agreed that space belongs to the entire human race and space has to be utilized for the benefit of mankind. Uh, and this has sustained for uh, 60 years since the launch of Sputnik. Uh, and th this is a very interesting fact, but also a very encouraging fact, at least uh, in, according to my view uh, of things. Uh, so there is a common interest between the space-faring nations and uh, the space community to keep it that way, because it benefits us all. Does it mean that we will see no rogue nation coming up and trying to do uh, uh, some kind of, of criminal act in space, nobody can tell. That can always happen, but I think it, if that will happen, then we will see uh, other nations uniting and cooperating in order to, to, to enforce the international conventions and the international agreements. There is, as you say, there's no law in space, so to speak. There's no police, there's no space police which enforces anything. So people voluntarily agree to act according to the international conventions. Yes. Um, and, and again, I look at it as a very promising thing. Uh, it shows the good of mankind and the possibility to cooperate and to collaborate exactly like you say. No guarantees here, but as long as we do that, um, we have a positive path forward. Yes, so it seems, and the promise is there, like you just said, but that was the promise we saw with the cyberspace also and with the internet, we hope and we wish that it was supposed to be used for the benefit of the humanity. But now see cyber warfare is a very complex you know, reality and it, uh, there is no turning back. It is a contested common and there is so much competition going on. So much warfare is happening in there. Similarly, I think space is also a contested common. There are no boundaries in space. You know, we cannot have uh, each nation cannot have their own territory. There are similarly, each nation cannot have their territory in the cyberspace also. So I, my question is, how will we manage the uncharted? I mean, while you are hoping that I'm hoping that 
that it remains you know peaceful and we have the cooperation and collaboration of you know the whole global community but it would be naive to think that it is going to remain like that just uh, uh, looking at the history or you know looking at the reality we see in cyberspace that it is a contested common and cyber warfare is a reality so space warfare is imminent it is going to happen as we you know start going towards mining asteroids and all that it is going to happen so how will we manage this uncharted territory of space warfare when we still uh, must contain cyber warfare well there are no easy answers for for everything don't get me wrong i'm really not naive uh, you know a few years back i wrote a paper about uh, the fourth dimension which is a uh, uh, space you know we uh, first humanity conquered the ground then the sea then the air and uh, then space and the fifth dimension by the way is the cyber security dimension or the cyberspace so to speak and you you're very right within the uh, cyberspace we are seeing cyber warfare uh, because it's very easy to do that. You can sit in front of your computer terminal at home and you can uh, uh, demolish a, a financial system of another nation uh, with a click of a button almost. Um, fortunately for us, space is a bit more difficult to reach. Is space for war for a reality? Yes, indeed. Uh, the nations or the spacefaring nations uh, within their military programs have space warfare assets because, you know, there's... Uh, uh, there's been warfare on the ground, at sea, at the air, and the next dimension for warfare is space. The existing dimension for warfare is cyberspace. We, we know that governments have their own uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, divisions within the military uh, community or within the uh, intelligence community because it's part of our day-to-day -day lives. It's a bit more difficult. It's, I'm not saying that it will not happen. I'm just saying that the challenge is much bigger. And also, if you think about why didn't we see up until now nations fighting in space, it's because that it's very difficult to protect your own assets. Just consider that you have a missile that can blow up a satellite of your enemy. Well, you've just created yourself, instead of one problem, you've created thousands of problems because if you blow up your enemy satellite, you have thousands of objects flying around in space. Uh, each and every one of them can devastate your own satellites and your own space assets. So you wouldn't do that. It's a kind of a, uh, a you know, a terror balance. I cannot hurt you because then I would hurt me even more uh, 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 than that. Uh, the other reason is that you require uh, huge resources in order to deploy weapons in space. So even if I, we could develop uh, uh, weapons that can operate from space, the cost of deploying them is very, very high, and it's just much more cost effective to put them on submarines, on airplanes, or, you know, on the grounds. So there are kind of almost physical limitations to, uh, to move space warfare to the, to the next level. Again, I'm not saying that it will not happen, uh, because, as you say, history has proved to us that if nations can fight, they will wherever they can yeah. uh, but but if you're asking about um what will happen due to the fact that we see more and more players coming into into the space sector so again uh, i th i just think that people have to demonstrate responsibility and the international community has to find ways to enforce uh, uh regulations and conventions at the rare event that somebody just doesn't care and do whatever he wants Absolutely, absolutely. And you are absolutely right that, you know, let's hope that we are able to maintain cooperation, collaboration and peace because there is so much unknown in the space. If, like you just said, you know, if someone tries to shoot a, sp a satellite uh, with a, you know, missile, what what is going to happen? What kind of implications there would be? Is it going to create some sort of uh, irreversible uh, damage to the universe or to the, our lower space? Or what other implications? If it's going to hit some asteroid, is that asteroid going to come back and hit our Earth? There are so many complex, complex, you know, questions and unknowns here. We just don't know enough about space. So let's hope that the warfare remains in the geospace and the cyberspace, and it 
doesn't move towards space because that's where we won't be able to manage the complex challenges and risks that comes with that warfare. We just don't know enough about the space. So let's work towards, you know, maintaining that collaborative and cooperative environment in space. So let me ask you about your organization now. What is the vision of your organization, Sky and Space Global? Um, well, as I've said, our goal at the moment is to be able to provide affordable communication services to anyone, anywhere, anytime, and to do that within the coming years. So by 2020, we will fully deploy our constellation, and we will build a, a successful commercial business, but on the other hand, providing for this basic human right of, of uh, uh, communication. So that is what we're focused at the moment. We have our first three satellites in space. Uh, only this morning, we have uh, announced to the to the market that we have passed through the in-orbit testing successfully. Uh, satellites are functioning as they should. We've tested communication between the satellites, from the satellites to the ground, and we're now just uh, starting to test the commercial applications themselves. So our goal is to deploy these 200 satellites safely, according to the international conventions and regulations, uh, not interfering with other operators, uh, but building a very successful commercial business. That's our goal uh, for the coming uh, few years. Congratulations on your milestone today, as you just you know announced to the market. So that is really very uh, positive, very good news. Now, what would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners, the young innovators who are so eager and so passionate to make a difference in the emerging sharing economy in space? Because everyone wants to if you see the young generation they are not after money they are after providing value they are after creating some lasting legacy some solving big problems that the humanity is facing what would you like to tell them well you know usually uh people say pursue your dream uh never give up if you'll only think positive things will be positive well i'm not going to say that what i am going to say is that it's going to be very difficult People will tell you no and no and no again before anyone will say yes to your plan. You'll be disappointed time and time again. Have what it takes if you have the, the backbone. If you have the resistance, even after people have rejected you and still pursue your dream, then you'll find uh, the success and then you'll find also your, your self-accomplishment. In that and you're very right we have a very gifted a new generation of uh, young people uh, who grow up who go to school who go to university and they come out out of it and they want to change the world uh, the problem is they believe that they will change the world immediately well it's not that easy it takes time it takes effort and you have to fail a few times before you actually succeed if you keep that in mind and if you keep on going and you never give up eventually you'll get there but remember, the road is tough. Uh, there are a lot of gifted people in the world. Just keep on pursuing your dream. Uh, it's not only about making a lot of money. It's about doing something that appeals to your heart as well, doing something that is really interesting and challenging for you. Uh, and if you can do that as well as changing the world for good, even for a little bit, then it's, it's a winning formula. Absolutely. And you are absolutely right about that. There is no easy road, but patience and perseverance will take you where you want to go. I mean, each one of us who are trying to make a difference, who are trying to solve some problem, like you are trying to solve the communication problem, you know, for uh, the humanity from each and every part of the corner of the world, you want to pr provide that communication channel. So it, it is the foundation on which people can build and people can grow their businesses, people can, you know, pursue their dreams. So you are trying to do that. And there are many others who are trying to do many other things. And uh, let's hope that the young generation, the youth, uh, the coming tomorrow of uh, the nations and the humanity, that they are able to see the opportunities beyond their immediate horizon and see towards the bigger problems. And there are some people, uh, Stephen Hawking says that, you know, humans have only 100 years left on Earth. If that is the case, then space exploration is a necessity. So let's hope that everyone, you know, comes together, puts their, you know, ideas and innovations and creativity into reality and uh, make the place for humanity, the survival and sustainability of humanity, 
possibility and uh, work towards that. But you are absolutely right, patience and perseverance. So thank you, Mayor, for participating in this roundup. Today, we appreciate your thoughtful insight on nanosatellites. Our global viewers and listeners will benefit tremendously from the information you provided on the democratization of space and the role nanosatellites could play and would play in the future. Even if a single individual or entity across nations can come up with an idea to innovate and advance the space age based on the understanding they received from the discussion we had today, this risk round of dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed our talk and, and remember to all your viewers, uh, if you're thinking about space and you're working in space, the sky is the lower limit. Absolutely. No, thank you so much. So democratization of space is on its way, at least as far as the lower orbits are concerned. While these miniaturized nanosatellites are affordable, accessible, effective and deployable and are going into space at an ever increasing rate, it is important to evaluate is security impact on cyberspace, geospace, and space. Risk groups, cybersecurity, geosecurity, and space security risk research centers are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIO and CGS, that means nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia in cyberspace, geospace, and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace, they walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, Risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts, they feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risks together. For more information on the risk roundups, to watch the risk roundup videos or hear the risk roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayeshree Pandya, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.